Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Rangers in Action demonstration will begin in four minutes. Please make your way to your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rangers in Action demonstration will begin in two minutes. Please find your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Rangers in action demonstration will begin in one minute. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rangers in action demonstration will begin in one minute. Please be seated. Before we begin, we would like to recognize some distinguished visitors in the audience. Please stand when your name is called to be recognized. Congressman Bishop, U.S. Representative for Georgia's 2nd Congressional District. General Milley, Chief of Staff of the Army. Lieutenant General Retired Barno, former commander of the 2nd Ranger Battalion and Combined Forces Command Afghanistan. Major General Miller, Commanding General, U.S. Army Maneuver Center of Excellence. Major General Retired Luer, responsible for the activation, organization, and training of the first modern-day Ranger Battalion and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. <laughs> Brigadier General McKean, Commandant of the United States Army Armor School. <laughs> Brigadier General Thompson, Commandant of the United States Military Academy. Colonel Retired Puckett, distinguished member of the brigade and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Yeah. Colonel Retired Chittenden, distinguished member of the brigade. Major Retired Spees, 
helped develop the desert phase of Ranger School, distinguished member of the brigade, and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. <laughs> Command Sergeant Major Mathain. Command Sergeant Major Ingram, Command Sergeant Major, U.S. Army Infantry School. <laughs> Command Sergeant Major Retired Greenway, a distinguished member of the brigade and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. <laughs> Command Sergeant Major Retired Gilbert, distinguished member of the brigade and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Command Sergeant Major Retired Smith, a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. <laughs> Command Sergeant Major Retired Mellinger, distinguished member of the 75th Ranger Regiment. <laughs> Sergeant Major Retired Spencer, a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Sergeant Major Retired Lockett, a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. First Sergeant Retired Block, distinguished member of the Brigade and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Master Sergeant Retired Malolo, a member of Merrill's Marauders in World War II and also a veteran of the Korean War and a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. Master Sergeant Retired Bat, a member of the Ranger Hall of Fame. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the commander of the 4th Ranger Training Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Sean Underwood.
gentlemen. I'm Staff Sergeant Grayson, an instructor here at the Benny Faison Ranger School. I have served in various light and airborne infantry units, most recently as a squad leader in the 2nd Battalion, 12th Infantry Regiment, based out of Fort Carson. I'm currently assigned to Bravo Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The history of the American Ranger is a long and colorful one, with a proud heritage which dates back some 400 years. During the American colonial periods, Ranger tactics and techniques and methods of operation were inherent characteristics in our frontiersmen. As early as the 1700s, these frontiersmen, commonly referred to as Rangers, were patrolling our frontier from the Carolinas to the New England in defense against the Indians. Probably the most famous and successful of these early units were Rogers Rangers, organized in 1756 by Major Robert Rogers. Presently, over 400 Ranger units have been formed by leaders such as Morgan, Mosby, Merrill, and Darby. The gallantry and success in combat is legendary. In World War II, Rangers operated in the Mediterranean and the Pacific, and they led the way onto the beaches of Normandy. During the Korean conflict, Ranger volunteers were trained here at Fort Benning, Georgia. They were formed into 18 airborne Ranger companies, 17 of which were airborne, and seven of which saw combat in the conflict, thus upholding the high Ranger standards for courage and daring. Rangers also served in the Republic of Vietnam, from the Delta to the DMZ, providing long-range reconnaissance and surveillance as eyes and ears for the commanders in the field. In 1983, During that same time period, with the activation of the Ranger Regiment, the establishment of light infantry divisions and a renewed emphasis on mid to low intensity conflict increased the importance for Ranger training. The Army recognized the need for Ranger qualified officers and non commissioned officers to provide leadership throughout the units of the Army. The success of this initiative was most evident in December of 1989 when the 75th Ranger Regiment, along with elements of the Special Operations Forces, successfully accomplished their mission during Operation Just Cause. More recently, Ranger qualified officers and non commissioned officers played a vital key to success in the accomplishment of the following missions. Operation Desert Storm, Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti, Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Ranger course is conducted in three separate phases. Each phase is conducted in a separate geographical location, and each location varies in terrain, from the steep mountains to the coastal swamps. The Benny phase is three weeks in duration and is conducted here Fort Benning, Georgia, by the 4th Ranger Training Battalion, followed by three weeks in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Dahlonega, Georgia, conducted by the 5th Ranger Training Battalion. Then finally, three weeks in the Florida Swamps at Eglin Air Force Base, conducted by the 6th Ranger Training Battalion. The purpose of the Ranger Corps is to develop leadership capabilities, confidence, competence, and combat functional skills to select officer and non-commissioned officer volunteers in Ranger tactics and techniques so that they upon completion of the Ranger Corps, can return to their units with the capability to conduct Ranger-type training. This increases the standard of training in the United States Army today and gives all infantry units the capability to conduct Ranger-type missions. Ranger School is realistic, rugged, and to some degree hazardous. A Ranger student will be taxed both physically and mentally during the nine weeks of training. However, some students are on the extended cycle program and have been recycling the vending phase of Ranger School since the summer of 2005. In summary, we feel that the Ranger Corps is the highest state of combat preparedness training that exists in the United States Army today. Next, we will demonstrate some of the tactics and techniques that the Ranger students have learned. I will be followed by Sergeant First Class Purdue, a United States Army Ranger. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sergeant First Class Purdue, and I'm an instructor here at the Benning Phase of Ranger School. I've served in various light and airborne units, most recently as a recon team leader in the 25th Infantry Division. I'm currently assigned to Bravo Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. Now, extensive demolitions training enables a Ranger to attack a wide variety of objectives. Now, although there are many different types of explosives in the world today, Composition C4 is the one most commonly used. As you can see, Composition C4 is a white plastic explosive that can be cut or molded into any shape, and due to its pliability, is used to construct a wide variety of expedient charges, a few of which we will discuss today, the first of these being the ribbon charge. Now, the ribbon charge is used to attack any flat or irregular shaped steel target. 
The next charge that we will discuss is the shape charge. The shape charge is used to attack any hard surface targets, such as vehicles or roads, and can be expediently constructed utilizing any type of cone-shaped material. The one you see in front of you has been constructed utilizing a number 10 can, with the cone shape being depressed directly into the composition C4. Now, as you can see, all of our demolitions are dual primed, and this is to ensure a positive detonation. And the final charge that we will discuss is the timber cutting charge. There are many different ways to employ the timber cutting charge. You can, as we have here, place the charge low on the tree and placing a kicker charge high on the opposite side of the tree. Or you could cut a section out of that tree, place the composition C4 into that cut, once again placing a good kicker charge high on the opposite side of the tree. Or you could encircle the entire tree in detonating cord, something like a ribbon charge. Now, all modern military-grade demolitions are primed utilizing the modernized demolition ignition system, otherwise known as MDI. MDI consists of a low or high-strength blasting cap attached to various lengths of time fuse or shock tube. These blasting caps, along with detonating cord and an M81 fuse igniter, can be used to create a variety of firing systems. As you can see, my demonstrator has a training board on which a few of these firing systems are displayed along with other demolitions accessories that the Rangers train to use. The first of these being the M81 fuse igniter. The M81 fuse igniter is used to ignite all lengths of time fuse or shock tube. Next, we have the M14 firing system. The M14 firing system is seven and a half feet in length. It has a factory crimp, high strength blasting cap on the end, and has an approximate five minute burn time. Next, we have the M21 and M23 firing systems. These have factory crimped M81s and high strength blasting caps, are 500 feet and 1,000 feet in length respectively, and are used to ignite all military grade demolitions. Now at the bottom, you will see other demolitions accessories that the Ranger is trained to use, to include dynamite, TNT, composition C4, and a flex linear charge. A flex linear charge is used to blow open doors or blow holes in walls so that assaulting elements can gain entrance to buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, please focus your attention to the far side of the pond. There you will see a Connex, whose doors have been rigged with one of these flex linear charges. You will also witness the detonation of a few of these other expedient charges. going to show you a few of the targets from previous demonstrations. The first of these being the ribbon charge. Notice the smooth, clean cut effect. Next we will show you a target from a shape charge. This shape charge blew a five inch hole into a quarter inch steel plate. any size tree. Now that we have shown you a few of the capabilities of Composition C4, we'll now discuss some of its characteristics. Some of the characteristics of Composition C4 are that it is virtually insensitive to shock or friction and may not explode with any type of rough handling. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, rest assured, Composition C4 is absolutely insensitive to shock or friction and can be beaten around without fear of detonation. <laughs> Another technique that the Ranger is trained to use is military mountaineering. I will be followed by Sergeant First Class Westover, a United States Army Ranger. Gentlemen, my name is Sergeant First Class Westover, an instructor here at the Benning Phase of Ranger School. I've served in various light and airborne infantry units, most recently as a platoon sergeant with the 82nd Airborne Division.
Print will be signed to Alpha Company. Yeah! Fourth Ranger Training Battalion. Repelling is an integral part of the mountaineering instruction taught during the Ranger course. It is a technique of descending a vertical surface by means of a mechanical device and is taught for several reasons. First, it helps the individual get over his inherent fear of heights. Secondly, it instills confidence and teaches him an additional capability. He learns once again there is virtually no impassable terrain for determined, well-trained, well-led force. In order to repel, certain items of mountaineering equipment are essential. First being the current metal rope. The current metal rope is 11 millimeters in diameter and 150 feet in length, and has a tensile strength of approximately 4,800 pounds. Another characteristic of this rope is its lack of elasticity. That is, it will not stretch more than 2% under normal working conditions. The range has also taught the use of the AMK, or Army Mountaineering Kit, which is a nylon harness assembly, the figure eight descender, which acts as a friction breaking device, and the locking snap link, which has a tensile strength of approximately 2,000 pounds. Last but not least, heavy leather work gloves are worn to prevent burning of the hands. To repel, the ranger will simply face the climbing rope at the anchor point to his left-hand side. He will grasp the rope, forming a bite, and feed it up and through the large opening of the figure eight descender, passing it through the locking snap link, which he will then tighten. The ranger will then don his heavy leather work gloves. One of the most difficult tasks the ranger will face here during ranger school. To begin his descent, the ranger will simply face the anchor point and begin walking backwards down the cliff. If at any time during his descent he desires to break, he will simply apply it. That is, the ranger will grasp the rope with his right hand. His right hand controls his rate of descent and supports his body weight. His left hand is merely a balancing or stabilizing agent. To continue his descent, the ranger will simply release the grip with his right hand and continue walking backwards down the cliff. In many cases, it may be necessary to haul personnel and equipment up a vertical surface. For this purpose, the ranger is taught the use of the vertical haul line. Notice the large heavy A-frame that is constructed and lashed together at the top of the cliff, with a sufficient amount of climbing rope to reach the bottom. At the apex of this A-frame, the rope is then fed through a snap link or pulley and tied together, creating what is known as an endless rope. At opposing extremes of this rope are tied two butterfly knots. The ranger will simply engage one of these two butterfly knots with his walking snap link and begin climbing the knotted hand line to the top of the cliff. Another type of repel is the Australian repel. This type of repel allows the ranger to observe the direction in which he is descending, using his left hand as his brake hand, allowing his right hand to be free to engage the enemy should it become necessary during his descent. In the event that a soldier is injured and a litter is not available, the ranger is also taught other various methods of casualty evacuation, this method being the buddy repel. The patient is secured to the ranger by means of a nylon runner and a snap link that connects to the ranger's own snap link. He is then seated across the lap of the ranger during the descent. If at any time during the descent the patient requires additional medical attention, the ranger can simply break and provide it. <laughs> and then continue with his descent. You may recall the term on repel used prior to their descent and the term off repel used once they have touched down. The term on repel implies that the ranger is about to begin his descent and that all personnel below them should look out for falling rocks and debris. The term off repel implies that the ranger has touched down, cleared his rope, and the next ranger may begin his descent. The ranger has also taught other various methods of insertion, such as the fast rope insertion extraction system, commonly referred to as fries. The fries rig consists of a 3 inch in diameter hemp rope that is approximately 100 feet in length. Additionally, it is attached to a modified H frame on an aircraft. The aircraft is a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter with an ACL or allowable cargo load of 13 combat equipped rangers. Today you'll observe a lurch team fast rope into the far side of the pond. As you can see, there is a sufficient amount of room for the aircraft to land, and in an actual situation it would do so. However, for today's demonstration, a lurch team shell fast rope onto the far side of the shore. The first action that you'll observe is the aircraft commander stabilizing the aircraft over the target area. Once over the target area, a rope will be deployed. Once the rope is deployed, a team of rangers will bend fast rope onto the land. As you can see, this type of insertion method allows for a team of rangers to be inserted into a heavily vegetated or urban environment in a very short period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the far side of the pond.
Currently in the United States Army, there are several long-range surveillance units, or LERs, that consist of six to 18 man teams that are primarily composed of range of qualified personnel. The mission of LERs is to identify enemy personnel and equipment and report their findings back to their commanders, thus enabling their commanders to direct their resources in order to defeat the enemy on the battlefield today. Because LERs perform various missions and hazardous assignments and terrain, special exfiltration methods have been devised in order to ensure their availability for future operations. One of these methods being the use of a spies rig and a helicopter. The spies rig consists of a two-in-one type rated nylon rope that is one inch in diameter and 120 feet in length. Additionally, a nylon harness assembly will be worn by each man who is to be suspended from this rope while in flight. Once again, the aircraft commander will be moving over to the target area. Once over the target area, a bag will be deployed. The spies rope is encased within this bag to prevent it from becoming entangled beneath the aircraft. At that point in time, the LERS team will then move from a cover to conceal position, engage their nylon harness assembly with the spies rope, and then signal to the aircraft commander, who will then lift them straight up above treetop level, avoiding all obstacles in the immediate vicinity, and move out in the desired direction of flight. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please direct your attention to the far side of the pond. The Rangers also taught the use of small boat operations on inland waterways and coastlines, such as the F-470 Zodiac that is approaching the shore to your front left. This boat is capable of carrying up to 10 fully equipped Rangers. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, this nine-man light infantry squad is organized and equipped for a combat patrol. Squad leader has the additional responsibility as a patrol leader. He is armed with the M4 carbine. The M4 carbine is a modified version of the M16. It has a shorter barrel and a collapsible buttstock. The Alpha and Bravo team leaders are in charge of their respective teams, both of which are armed with the M4 carbine. The Bravo team leader has the additional responsibility as the assistant patrol leader. The automatic weapons are armed with the M249 squad automatic weapon, or SAW which primarily fires ammunition from 200 round ammunition drums. However, in emergency situations, may also fire 30 round magazines. The Grenadiers 
armed with M320 grenade launchers. It fires a variety of multi-purpose 40 millimeter grenades, such as high explosive, illumination, CS, and buckshot. And finally, the two riflemen, both of which are armed with the M4 carbine. One of the riflemen has the additional responsibility as a squad radio telephone operator. He carries the ANPRC-119 Singars Tactical FM radio, which is capable of sending secure and data telecommunications with hire. The other riflemen carries the mountaineering equipment should it become essential throughout the patrol. And as you can see, equally distributed throughout the squad are various pieces of equipment, such as the ICOM radio, PVS-14s, PQ-2, AT-4, claymores, hand grenades, and the RFR badge. The ICOM radio is used for internal communications between the squad leader and his squad. It assists him in maintaining control of his element throughout the operation. PVS-14s are a singular night vision device used for, during the hours of limited visibility for short-range close-in viewing. PQ-2 is a target designator and can designate targets to a range of 400 meters with the assistance of a night vision device during the hours of limited visibility. The M136AT4 is a shoulder-fired anti-armor weapon system encased in an expendable fiberglass tube and can penetrate up to 14 inches of armor. The M18A1 Claymore Mine houses a pound and a half of C4 and when detonated, projects over 700 ball bearings towards its target. And as you can see, each ranger carries two hand grenades. Finally, each ranger is certified as a ranger first responder. He is equipped with a ranger first responder badge. He is trained in advanced medical skills such as triage, treating, and evacuating life-threatening injuries found on the battlefield today. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, this nine-man light infantry squad is organized and equipped for a combat patrol. During Ranger School, it is necessary for each Ranger student to successfully complete a series of confidence tests. You have already observed the suspension traverse, which was demonstrated earlier. You now observe the log walk rope drop. The first action you will observe is Ranger Possible negotiating the horizontal ladder, or the vertical ladder. Once on top of the vertical ladder, he will then negotiate the horizontal log to include the three-step obstacle. He will then make his way to the far side, where he will mount the rope using the commando or combination of the commando and/or monkey crawl. As he makes his way out to the tab, hangs free, and requests permission to drop some 40 feet into the refreshing water below. What do you think, class? One more? One more. <laughs> drop, Ranger. Small boat operations are not the only waterborne operation the Ranger is taught. Helo casting is the means of inserting a Ranger squad with use of helicopters. Today you will observe a four-man Ranger team inserted into the pontier front. The first action that you will observe is the aircraft stabilizing at 10 feet 10 knots over the target area. Once over the target area, the first two-man team will then eject their poncho raft and exit from both sides. The next two-man team will then repeat the same process. To construct a poncho raft, the two-man Ranger team will then lay out a standard issue poncho. They will place their rucksack and any additional items inside. Additionally, they will waterproof this equipment as it will aid in its flotation once it reaches the water. Additionally, a tether line is tied to one end of the poncho. This will assist the rangers by guiding it from the front and, pulling it from, and pushing it from the rear. Additionally, as soon as they reach the land, they will remove all equipment and move out to conduct the ranger mission. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the poncho my front.
Strange is also taught on the various methods of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Your narrator is Staff Sergeant Shucker, a United States Army Ranger. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Staff Sergeant Shucker. I'm an instructor here at the Benning Phase of Ranger School. I've served in numerous airborne and light infantry units, most recently as a reconnaissance team leader in the 25th Infantry Division. I'm currently assigned to Charlie Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The average soldier, if trained over the use of his basic weapon, may become ineffective if his weapon should fail to fire or if he should break it or lose it. But with the knowledge in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the confidence and the aggression to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Ranger is able to attack and defeat his opponent. In combat, our Rangers are often faced with complex situations where the enemy is difficult to recognize. Imagine a team of Rangers conducting a combat patrol in the mountains of Afghanistan or in the streets of Baghdad when they're encountered by a suspicious individual <laughs> who appears unarmed but becomes hostile. We teach hand-to-hand -hand combat for several reasons. First, it is an excellent physical conditioner and body toughener. Second, it creates an aggressive spirit and instills the will to fight. Third, it instills confidence in the ranger's abilities and that of his fellow rangers. Fourth, it teaches the ranger techniques in defending himself if unarmed and faced with an armed opponent. And lastly, it serves as a base for the ranger so he knows how to properly set up hand-to-hand -hand training once he returns to his unit. We stress several fundamentals during hand-to-hand -hand combat. First, use your enemy's momentum to your advantage. Notice the demonstrator did not try to match his opponent's strength. He simply used his momentum to send him into motion. During hand-to-hand -hand combat, it is inevitable that the fight will end up on the ground. To defeat this form of attack, all rangers are taught in the grappling techniques of jiu-jitsu. Notice how the demonstrator is on top or the mounted position. From this position, he's able to strike his opponent with his fists and elbows, <laughs> use numerous arm bars, and even chokes. For example, the cross-collar choke. Notice the demonstrator is now on the bottom. Though on the bottom, he is still the dominant fighter. He uses his legs to create distance between himself and his opponent. Also from this position, he is still able to deliver strikes, chokes, and arm bars. Jiu-Jitsu originated in Japan over 3,000 years ago. It was brought to Brazil in the 1920s. Through the tireless efforts of the Gracie family of Rio de Janeiro, it has evolved one of the most efficient forms of unarmed combat. Using Jiu-Jitsu as a base, an integrated system of unarmed combat was developed using elements of Judo, wrestling, boxing, Muay Thai, along with marksmanship and contact weapons training. As a result, we now have the modern army combatant program. The first thing the Ranger is taught is a good, balanced position. Notice this is nothing more than a modified box. This is known as the Ranger's physical balance or the on guard position. Next thing a Ranger is taught is the different ranges of hand to hand combat. First, projectile range. This is nothing more than the range an object can be shot or thrown at an opponent. Next is striking range. 
This is the range you're able to strike your opponent using a weapon, fist, or a kick. Next is grappling range. Grappling range is further broken down into the post, frame, and hook ranges. This is the post range. Notice the demonstrator still maintains separation from his opponent to allow strikes to still be delivered. Next is the frame range. Notice the demonstrator still maintains separation, but has reduced it by placing his forearm in his opponent's chest. This allows for strikes to still be delivered or the use of secondary weapons such as a knife. Notice the demonstrator has now closed the distance between himself and his opponent. This is the hook range. This allows for more decisive strikes. The next two fundamentals that we stress is that of speed and accuracy. With the emphasis placed on these two fundamentals, speed and accuracy can only be achieved through practice. We also teach rangers to use any means necessary to attack and defeat their opponent. This includes the element of surprise. It's like this every day, ladies and gentlemen. They're always like this. We teach rangers a series of throws, holds, and takedowns. We will now demonstrate. Crosshawk takedown. And the front leg takedown. You'll notice this leaves the demonstrator in a very vulnerable position. Demonstrators, ladies and gentlemen. In the event the ranger finds himself faced with an opponent who is armed with a knife and he himself is unarmed, we also teach knife disarming counters. You will notice the main objective is to gain possession of the knife. We teach Ranger a series of knife fighting techniques and vulnerable points, that is, where to strike your opponent with the knife. The counter to the upward stroke of the knife. To 
pistol rifle is more than likely a weapon the Ranger will be faced with on the battlefield. We also teach rifle disarming techniques. may be faced with a situation where his primary weapon becomes ineffective, and he must use other means to attack and destroy his enemy. So we teach a series of moves to transition to a secondary weapon, such as a knife. Rangers to get this trash out of my pit. Since ranger operations are conducted deep behind enemy lines, the ranger may be faced with a situation where he has to silence an armed sentry. Therefore, we teach special silent kill techniques. One technique that we teach is the use of a garrot. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will now direct your attention to Staff Sergeant Betcher, who will demonstrate the use of an actual garrot on this poor, unsuspecting watermelon. Now, Staff Sergeant Fa Frazier will demonstrate the use of a garrot on Staff Sergeant Troyani. Imagine the stealth and cunning it must take to sneak up on an armed sentry deep behind enemy lines and take him out without being detected. Hey, Sergeant Frazier, I think that kick was a bit much. Hey, Sergeant Torian, if you can't handle it, you come out here and embarrass yourself in front of a ranger community or other deaths or a graduating class. You're right. We're professionals. We'll handle this back to Camp Rogers. But for now, let's shake on it. Still, Rangers is going in. He's going in. Hand-to-hand <laughs> -hand combat teaches the Ranger to be alert, aggressive, and confident in his ability to overcome and, regardless of the circumstances, destroy his enemy. With the knowledge and skills learned here in Ranger School, the end result is a soldier that is capable of being a leader and trainer of small units. He has mastered small unit operations, infiltration and exfiltration techniques, hand-to-hand -hand combat, demolitions, survival, evasion, resistance, escape, low-altitude mountaineering, and small boat operations. He is the epitome of the infantryman, the finest soldier in the world. And from what you have seen in this demonstration today, a soldier that is capable of appearing at any place at any time.
Guys, let's leave the white. Thank you for attending the Rangers in Action demonstration. The Rangers who participated in today's demonstration will be located in front of the bleachers if you'd like to talk to them or see their weapons and equipment. The graduation ceremony will begin in 10 minutes. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Rangers lead the way. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduation ceremony will begin in five minutes. Please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduation ceremony will begin in three minutes. Please make your way to your seats.
ladies and gentlemen, the graduation ceremony will begin in two minutes. Please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the graduation ceremony will begin momentarily. Please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the graduation ceremony for Ranger Class 815. Reviewing today's graduation is Command Sergeant Major Curtis Arnold, and today's guest speaker is Major General Scott Miller. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and render the appropriate courtesy as the colors pass and remain standing for the invocation and national anthem.
Today's invocation will be given by Chaplain Winton, the Airborne and Ranger Train Brigade Chaplain. I invite you to join me in prayer, and I'll be praying in Jesus' name. Almighty God, it is right for us to thank you this morning, for you have created life in such a way and demonstrated through the life of your own son that nothing worthwhile in life comes without a price. We know that this is true in our nation's history, and this is true for these rangers today. These rangers have indeed, indeed persevered and overcome obstacles such as scrutiny, illness, deprivation, and even lightning strikes. We praise you for creating these rangers and sovereignly working in their lives, that you would knit within the very fabric of them the attributes and competencies necessary to fight on to the ranger objective and complete the mission. Their mission has just begun to be ready to lead American soldiers in combat, keep them ever dependent upon you and one another, that they might continue to live as more elite soldiers in every aspect of their chosen professions, physically, tactically, and morally. We thank you for the Ranger cadre who did more than evaluate their performance, but exemplified and instructed what it means to live as a Ranger. We commit those Rangers who are fighting the good fight even now and those rangers who have paid the ultimate sacrifice and all of their families to your powerful and personal care. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please, rem please remain standing and render the appropriate honors for the national anthem performed today by Staff Sergeant Jones. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air they proved through the night that our flag was still there. O oh, Satan's and star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free And the home of the Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Command Sergeant Major for the Airborne Ranger Train Brigade, Command Sergeant Major Curtis Arnold. Good morning. What a great day it is to be a U.S. Army Ranger. General Miller, sir, first. Welcome and congratulations on your selection as the 39th Chief of Staff of the Army. We're truly honored by your presence here today. Congressman Bishop, sir, thank you for attending. Lieutenant General Retired Barnum, H minus, sir. Command Sergeant Major Wright, Major General Miller, Brigadier General McKean, other distinguished general officers and guests, Command Sergeant Majors Matheny, Ranger Hall of Fame members, Command Sergeant Majors, families and friends, but most of all, the graduating class 0815. Thank you for joining the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade today and sharing this momentous occasion with our newest Ranger.
There certainly weren't this many people at my graduation ceremony. <laughs> class 815 would surely go down in history for many reasons. The human instrument stories from this class abound, ranging from lightning strike survivors to cancer survivors, even a road to ranger soldier, and yes, the first women graduates of ranger school. Standing before you are the graduates of class 8-15. 364 st soldiers started this class, and 96 stand before you. Of those soldiers, only 40% or correction, only 40 went straight through. What a testament that is to the difficulty of this course. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for these graduates? Rangers, welcome to the club. I'd like to also take this opportunity to recognize the best soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and most importantly, the Ranger instructors who are the most professional soldiers in our Army today. These soldiers are, are the soldiers who upheld the standard, the Ranger standard, the only standard. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for these soldiers as well? As previously stated, this course was designed to last 62 days, but many have chosen the extended route. Many have been here for well over 120 days. I guess some people just need a challenge or they just enjoy our hospitality here in, in the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. Well, here though, these Rangers have learned to be tough, resilient soldiers. They've discovered their strengths and overcame their weaknesses. Now, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, I would like to welcome today's guest speaker, Major General Scott Miller. Major General Miller is the current Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Benning, Georgia. His entire biography can be found in your program, and is highlighted by his assignments in the 75th Ranger Regiment and other elite Army units. Major General Miller has led or commanded Rangers his entire distinguished Army career in training and in combat. Today also marks his 30-year anniversary of graduating from Ranger School, where he was, in fact, a distinguished honor graduate. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce not only a mentor, but also a friend, Major General Scott Miller. wasn't supposed to tell you all that. The, uh, just, just very quickly, I uh, actually took some time to write some notes today. And uh, I'm not really one for uh, written speeches, but I probably have a few things that need to be said on this particular graduation. So I'll, I will work that. For the graduates out here, bear with me a little bit. Usually I'm a uh, three-minute speaker. I think this may just go a little bit longer uh, than normal. But what I do want to say is I want to welcome uh, all of our distinguished guests. Uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Bishop, uh, you're always out here at Fort Benning, and I very much appreciate your attendance here uh, today. Thank you, sir. <laughs> General Milley, as many of you know, is our uh, newest Chief of Staff of the Army, 39th Chief. And uh, quite frankly, uh, as somebody I've known for many, many years, he always goes to where he thinks it's very important. And I think he marks this occasion because he knows the importance of it. But sir, welcome back to Fort Benning and very much appreciate your attendance today. Now I have a, uh, another group I just want to go ahead and uh, introduce real quick. They're not, they're not many and they don't want to be introduced, but I think it's important. Uh, Kurt Arnold told you it's my 30th anniversary tomorrow of when I graduated from class 11-85. And in the crowd is uh, John Porter, who at the time was a 175 Ranger and has served many, many years with me since that time. Uh, you also have Mike Palacios and Mike Lambert. Mike Lambert's still active. Mike Palacios and uh, Mike Lambert were both uh, fellow Rangers, me out at 2nd Ranger Battalion, and, and all three of those have taught me a tremendous amount over my military career. So men, welcome here today as well. And uh, just real quickly, J.R. Edens, I know you're out here somewhere. Uh, Staff Sergeant Edens was our class tech. And we actually liked our class tack, even though he was a little bit hard on us. But he was, a, he was really a source for getting us through this, uh, this course. Um, aside from those, we have what I call our regulars here at graduation. And regulars does an absolute disservice. And they've been introduced one time before. Uh, but when I talk about our regulars, I'm talking about our legends. They're Ranger Hall of Famers. Uh, they support you know, not only the Ranger School, the Ranger Regiment, and the entire Fort Benning community. 
but they're uh, legends like uh, Colonel Ralph Puckett, Command Sergeant Major, retired Jeff Mellinger, Bill Spies, you're over there. I see you uh, running around. Uh, Vince, uh, our, uh, our Merrill's Marauder, is sitting in the front row. Ladies and gentlemen, these are true legends. I would ask you to give them a round of applause. Out here are the special guests, but with them, attached to them, are their friends and family. So I want to welcome not just our graduate, but the friends and family who have come out here to show their support for some individuals who have been through some pretty tough Army training. Now just very quickly, 22 August 1985, just 30 years ago tomorrow, our company was known as Lima Company, licensed to kill. We graduated this course. We didn't come out here to Victory Pond. We did it on Todd Field. And if I recall, the Ranger instructors got one last uh, burst out of us by making us double time across the parade field, calm cadence, and uh, we were probably not in a great, great mood to go running at that point, but we were going out for our Ranger tab. But literally, we ran across the field. Interestingly enough, General Rainey spoke at this graduation uh, in June. And what he said, he said, I'm not going to talk very long because no one remembers the guest speaker anyway, and they certainly don't remember what he says. But I actually do remember my guest speaker. And he's actually here present today. It's Sergeant Major retired Bob Spencer, who in June of 1985 had just vacated and retired the position that Kurt Arnold holds today. <laughs> now, I think it's uh, appropriate that he's here because I think his remarks to my class are very, ring very true to what we probably ought to say at every, every ranger school. He said, more or less, he said, you have people that will question the standards of ranger school. When they question those standards, what I ask you to do is invite them back to Fort Benning, Georgia, and revalidate their tab. To date, <laughs> we've had zero takers on people who want to come back and validate the tab. Now, what's interesting, I know why he said it. I, t I tell the story. I was 1185, and John and Mike and Mike and Sar Sergeant Edens could probably vouch for this more than anybody. We were truly the last easy Ranger course to go through here. <laughs> I say we were the last easy class because we had a 24-hour break between a phase. And uh, as far as I know, there's never been a 24-hour break be between a phase before or since. So I say as far as I know, because I've never really cared to check on it, but the point is, is we got a 24-hour break. And I took off with my two PFC Ranger buddies, Spike Sawyer and Beast Gilbert, and what we did with our 24-hour break is we had a really, really good time. In other words, we squandered it, and we showed back up at camp the next morning more exhausted than when we started. So I advise we don't ever give those 24-hour breaks anymore. But again... You know, let's get back to what I, I refer to as a here and now and get back to the business at hand. You'll notice I'm wearing a soft cap. Ranger instructors will refer to it as a uh, patrol cap. With me, I have my two berets. I have a black beret, which represents my service in the United States Army, and I have a tan beret, of which I'm authorized to wear as well. And the reason I brought these two berets and chose to wear neither is because the last time we had this much excitement across the community, was when we were arguing over a piece of headgear. <laughs> that was in 2001. And I'll tell you, the internet was not quite as mature in 2001 as it is today, but there was a lot of anxiety. But very quickly, if you think of the time frame, we put the headgear issue aside and we got back to work because there was a nation's business that was at hand and that's what we settled down to get, our, get focused on. Now, what I, the other piece I'd like to just say about this headgear, and I'm probably wearing it incorrectly, and my command sergeant major and other senior non-commissioned officers might have a little bit of trouble with it, but when you go out there and you watch a ranger instructor, and you watch him imparting instruction to their students, oftentimes they take a little liberties with their headgear, and they'll wear it back just a little bit. This is in honor of them. 
These are the ranger instructors. Kurt Arnold already talked about. They make this course happen. They probably had more pressure, self-generated, more scrutiny on them than any other ranger instructor throughout the history of this course. They get up in cycle, and they show up for work, and it's a 30-hour work day. And they are responsible for the men and women and the soldiers you see out in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big round of applause for our ranger instructors. Now I'll tell you, everybody's got a ranger school story, and of course, you know, I have my opinions on ranger schools. It's something different to everybody who's been through here. I'd say so. We've heard it called, you know, the premier leadership course. But I'll tell you from my personal vantage point, if you go through this course and you're standing on this, uh, out in front of this group, at some point during this course, you found a moment of vulnerability where you weren't the best you wanted to be. But what it is, is what you do with that moment of vulnerability. Are you able to overcome, persevere, no matter how hard the task may seem? And as importantly, are you able to help the team overcome and persevere and accomplish their assigned mission? At the last Ranger Hall of Fame induction, many of who are sitting here today, I heard an inductee talk about what the Ranger tab meant for him. He said when he shook hands with fellow Rangers, there was something special behind that handshake. I believe what he's talking about was trust, dependability, and reliability. Something special behind that handshake. Now, I really hate to do this, but I have to. I feel I have to address some of the nonsense on the internet, mostly because it's noisy, but primarily because it's inaccurate. If you read Roberts Rogers Rules, and everybody in the Ranger community knows who I'm talking about, we have some truisms that date back to the French and Indian War that we live by. We have some that we refer to as our standing orders. Now, I'm not going to read them all to you, but they work really well for the things we're trying to do, such as, one, don't forget nothing. <laughs> Two, have your musket clean as a whistle, hatchet scoured, 60 rounds powder and ball, and be ready to march at a minute's warning. But it's rule number four I'd like to focus some tension. Tell the truth about what you see and what you do. There is an army depending on us for correct information. Ladies and gentlemen, rap week has not changed. Standards remain the same. The five mile run is still five miles. The times don't adjust. A 12 mile road march is still 12 miles. Time standards do not adjust. The required rucksack weights remain the same. Ranger students must pass patrols and piers. The mountains of Dahlonega are still here. The swamps remain intact. There was no pressure from anyone above me to change standards. And lastly, the President of the United States was not planning, nor is he here today. <laughs> So with all this said, and I'll know there's some who still don't believe, and I go back to the words of Sergeant Major Spencer on 22 August 1985, or excuse me, 22 August, yeah, 1985, with a very explicit invitation. If you don't believe, grab your rucksack, come on down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and Kurt Arnold and Dave Fivecoat and roll you in the next rap week. <laughs> to the students of 8-15, you have acquitted yourselves quite well. Many of those who began with you did not finish. If you just look at June, 364 stepped forward. Of that 364, 40 went straight through the course. 40 out of 364. Another 56 were added over the course through recycles to see, reform the 96 graduates you see before here. Others continue to work their phase, work their way through some part of the recycle phase. It is all of you who know the challenge of persevering through pri privation where most humans would just quit. You're leaving Victory Pond here today with a small piece of cloth on your shoulders. But more importantly, you carry the title of Ranger from here on out. Your subordinates, your peers, your leaders, 
You'll always expect you to be able to handle the toughest tasks. They and your country will expect you to move further, faster, and fight harder than any other soldier. Congratulations. Very well done. When I shake your hand, I know there's something special behind that handshake. Rangers lead the way. The families and friends of the honor graduates may now join the reviewing party for the presentation of awards and ranger tabs. Family and friends of the other graduates, please remain seated. The reviewing party today consists of Colonel David Fivecoat, the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade Commander, Command Sergeant Major Arnold, General Milley, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and Major General Miller, and Colonel Retired Ralph Puckett, who will present each of the awardees with a signed copy of his book, Words for Warriors. The following individuals are being recognized for outstanding achievement as class tactical advisors for class 815. Sergeant First Class, Joshua Evans from the 4th Ranger Training Battalion. Sergeant First Class, William Foster from the 5th Ranger Training Battalion. And Sergeant First Class, Edward Lee from the 6th Ranger Training Battalion. Their vast knowledge, exceptional instructor abilities, and sound leadership greatly impacted the Ranger students. Their dedication to duty reflects great credit upon them, the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade, and the United States Army. The recipient of the William O. Darby Distinguished Honor Graduate Award is Staff Sergeant Michael Calderon from the 4th Infantry Division. His outstanding performance has exceeded the Distinguished Honor Graduate criteria. For his achievements, Major General Luer from the National Ranger Memorial Foundation will now present Staff Sergeant Calderon with a stone that will be engraved with his name and placed on the walkway to the Ranger Memorial, located here at Fort Benning. The Ranger Memorial serves to... <laughs> the Ranger Memorial serves to recognize the contribution of Rangers and Ranger units past, present, and future of the United States Army. Additionally, Ranger... Calderon will receive a plaque provided by the National Ranger Association. He is also receiving a certificate of achievement from the commander of the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. The recipient of the Corporal Glenn M. Hall Enlisted Honor Graduate Award is Sergeant Talon Patterson from the 75th Ranger Regiment. For his outstanding performance, he will receive a plaque donated by the National Ranger Association in honor of Corporal Hall's invaluable service in the Ranger community. Additionally, Sergeant Patterson is receiving a Certificate of Achievement from the Commander of the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. The recipient of the Command Sergeant Major Michael Kelso Enlisted Leadership Award is Staff Sergeant James O'Mara of the 7th Special Forces Group. This award is provided courtesy of the National Ranger Association and is given to the top enlisted graduate for his outstanding leadership abilities, initiative, and motivation. He is also receiving a certificate of achievement from the commander of the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade. The recipient of the Lieutenant Colonel Keith Antonio Officer Leadership Award is Second Lieutenant Isaac Minor from the Infantry Basic Officer Leader Course. This award is provided courtesy of the National Ranger Association and is given to the top commission officer for his outstanding leadership abilities, initiative, and motivation. Additionally, he's receiving a certificate of achievement from the commander of the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. Please join us in one final round of applause for these outstanding Rangers.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends of the remaining graduates may now leave the bleachers and come forward to pin on their Rangers tab. The ceremony will resume in six minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony will resume in five minutes. Please begin making your way back into your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you plan to make your way out of the bleachers and back to your cars before the end of the ceremony, please do so using the right side of the bleachers as you're facing the pond. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, if you plan to leave the area, please do so leaving the right side of the bleachers as you're facing the pond. The side away from the rappel tower towards the log walk rope drop. Thank you.
lost track of him. He's new. Yeah? Uh, the, the two females. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All Rangers present, please rise and join Ranger Class 815 in reciting the Ranger Creed. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the playing of the Army song. Gentlemen, this concludes the graduation ceremony for Ranger Class 0815. On behalf of the Airborne Ranger Train Brigade Commander and Command Sergeant Major, we thank you for your attendance. We ask that you all remain in your place for the departure of the Chief of Staff of the Army.
Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you remain patient as you try to board the buses back to the parking lot. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're leaving the bleachers, please leave to the right side of the bleachers as you're facing the pond. The right side of the bleachers, away from the podium. Thank you. <laughs> 